for and how do we know him? As we have spent time with him every day in the Word of God, seeing the truth of Christ. And I think the choir have seen that. There's a young pastor that uh, they just finished the training and been to seminary and he's going to actually preach his first sermon to the church. And he revived the message and his grandfather was a pastor and he went to him to ask him, I guess, parts of the trade and parts of sharing and what it would take and how long do you talk and how long do you share? And he said that uh, uh, the older pastor said he read the scripture and <coughs> taught the word of God and uh, to that. But as far as the length of time, one thing he had started doing always was to take a peppermint out and he put it in his mouth. And then as the peppermint dissolved and when it was gone, then he would know to finish his sermon. He could preach about the length of the peppermint piece of candy. And the young preacher said, that's no problem. He got up to speak and stood the peppermint in his mouth and began to preach and preach and 90 minutes rolled around and he was still preaching and the peppermint still was in his mouth and uh, he rolled in about two hours and was still going and finally he asked, he said, can I just take a minute and reach in his mouth and pull out a button? And he said, oh, okay, got longer and longer, so uh, how long will you preach, I guess, etc. How long it takes that button is all in his mouth, so uh, you got to be a long sermon. I do want to share with you this morning the book of Exodus chapter 12 and the uh, book, I put verses 12 through 28, we'll actually just look at 11, 12, and 13 uh, in this part of the God's Word as we finish um, the 10th plague upon Egypt. As last week we looked at the ninth, and really the underlying points of that message was Moses, really the epitaph of Moses, was, you know, the character that he found in God and that he lived for God. And we looked at the characteristics of God, if you remember, what led Moses to be such an obedient follower. A sinner, yes, and a man who struggled most definitely, and he had been reared in a very difficult way in his life, but yet he found God and found that the characteristics of that loving God to be his, and God would take him and use him. And if you remember, I went to the book of Deuteronomy there and looked at the closing parts of Moses' life, and it said, there's not been a prophet before or since to which knew God face to face as Moses. So Moses began to follow God and began to see what he could do for his life and to, to go through the struggles. But he actually had a first-hand experience of what God could do and the power and the authority of this sovereign, omnipotent God that was in Egypt. And there I shared last week about the ninth plague and the really underlying principle of that was not only the power of God, but God demonstrating that power to Pharaoh. Because, as I shared, remember, to the Egyptians, the Pharaoh was a god. He was their god. He was their omnipotent. He was their controller. He was who they worshipped. And God reminded them that the god to which they served was absolutely nothing compared to the Jehovah God to who was there with Moses. And if you remember, the ninth plague was the plague of darkness. And to the Egyptians, the god not only was Pharaoh, but he was the god of the Nile and the God of the sun. And there God brought upon darkness, upon the face of the earth, and upon Egypt, there for three days, and it was so dark, if you remember me sharing, that you could not even see the hand in front of your face. He reminded them, I am the God of the Nile River, I am the God of the sun, and I am the God of sovereignty to whom you shall serve. And that was last week. And today the final plague will come upon them, and it was actually brought about by Pharaoh himself. As we finished last week, you remember Moses was speaking to, to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said, Leave me, Moses. Leave me, or you shall surely die. I will kill you. And Moses said, You have spoke the words to which you have cursed yourself. From this point on, you will never see my face again. And Moses left the palace to go, and this is where we come today, the institution of the Passover. It's a very powerful part of the Bible. It's, a very, almost a, it's very difficult to preach about the Passover and the importance of the Passover in one message. It literally is. Because it's so important. You have to remember that the Passover was as important to the Jews as the crucifixion is to Christians. It is an underlying principle of their faith. Not only that, but an underlying principle of their history. To which God would take them in captivity and in torture and move them back to the promised land. It would be through the Passover. It is very important in their life. But I want us to see this today. Because the Bible Teachers, if you read about the Bible a lot, or maybe read commentaries, or uh, our books through maybe the people have written, and I want you to always remember in any of those books that you may read, and they're encouraging words, encouraging books, remember they're not the Bible. They're to never take the place of the Bible, and they're never to be taught like the Bible. The Bible is God's Word, 
he has only allowed these people to write these books. You always remember that when you read the, a book maybe by a pastor. And I'm not saying they're not great books and they're foundational books and they may help build your character and who you are as a person. But the true growing of a Christian to know Jesus more is through the Word of God. It's to never be neglected. David, taking up God's Word and building that relationship. That will give you through difficult times or trying times or through the times of your life. Not a book written by some man. And like I said, there's, um, there are great pastors that write these books. But God's Word is to never be substituted for anything. And that's where we are today. And then the Bible scholars, they sometimes write about types of things and pictures. And that's what we're going to look at today. A picture in the Old Testament that came to life in the New. Now Jesus is in here. And it, it, if you read the New Testament, you can see in there that the writers there will sometimes see Jesus. If you read the book of Matthew, he describes Jesus like Moses. A man who would go into the, into the pits of danger and to bring out of people and to make a way for them. He was like Jesus was as Moses who would go back. And Paul in his writing, he's writing about Jesus Christ too as he would see him. And how did he see who Jesus was and the power of that? But he would see him as the new Adam, if you remember, he said it is that Jesus is the second Adam. Adam was born of God in the Garden of Eden, and the second Adam who came by woman out through Mary was Jesus Christ. And he defined him as that. And then in the writer of Hebrews, if you read Hebrews, it takes the, the role of Christ and the role of him as priest, and the tabernacle in which is built was really a picture of God's presence on earth. Because the Bible says that God would come and dwell in the tabernacle. Remember, he would go into the Holy of Holies, to which they built by hand. And you've got to think about the difficulty of moving this group of people as Moses did. Not only the millions of people throughout the wilderness, but every time they would stop and set a camp, they would erect the tabernacle to the exact specifications to which God had given them, and God would come and set among them in the Holy of Holies. And then the writer of Hebrews defined that as God would come to this earth through Christ and set with us. And he would separate and devour the curtain and would tear it in two to what would separate the holy holies and there Christ dwelt with us. There were types, there were pictures. And that's what I want us to see today, the importance of that. The tenth plague is coming upon Egypt, the final, the final straw to the dismissal, the exodus of the children of Israel back to Canaan. And on that route. It's interesting. Why did God, I, I was really thinking, you know, why did God bring the plagues? Why does He bring them upon them? And there are different pictures and there are different reasons. You know, some believe it's to, to really break Pharaoh completely into humility. A man who thought of himself as a God, a man and who had everything the world had to offer financially, educationally, intellectually. He had everything there was. He was a young man that had been molded to be the Pharaoh of the greatest kingdom and providence in the world. And there he sat on the throne. And God the Sovereign came. And what are the plagues really to crack him? To remind him, you're not in control. I think God reminds us that a lot of times in our own lives. We're not in control. We think we are. And then something happens in our lives. Maybe it's a tragedy. Maybe it's a difficulty. Or maybe it's a struggle. And God reminds you, you're not in control. I am. It's a time of trusting. Maybe that was it. Maybe it was a time that, you know, that for God to convince Pharaoh of who he was and that sovereignty and that power and that authority. And to some extent, maybe it was just to punish the Egyptians because of their sin and because of their idolatry and their worship of false gods. And whatever we may see, in the light of that, I don't really see that as God is... God can do anything in His will and His power because I've heard people say, you know, that's why Hurricane Katrina came and hit New Orleans because of the sin and the, the gambling that was there. And I, I, I'm not God, and nor is, is He asked me questions about doing so. But in that picture, I don't really... The world is filled with sin and evil from Yadkin County to New Orleans to L.A. to around the world. And so God, He, in His judgment, He brought those plagues, and in His judgment... He brought them upon Pharaoh and upon the people who knew him not. In his judgment, he did that. But in his grace, he came to dwell in this tenth plague. It's a perfect picture of Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to share with you today. It's really of the grace and the love 
and the mercy of God brought here in the book of Exodus. It's very powerful. Now, I'm going to share with you these three verses, and you can read the remainder of those down through 28 if you like. But I just want to read 11, 12, and 13. And to kind of let you see where we are, Moses has departed from Pharaoh's palace, and they're preparing for departure. They're preparing to leave Egypt. After over 460 years of bondage, these people are going to depart. Their Savior, their leader, has come. Moses is there to take them. And it says, And thus you shall eat with it your loins dirty, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be for you as a token upon the houses that you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you and destroy you when I smite the Egyptians. I really, I'm reminded here of this passage of who it is and what takes place here. And I'm to, it says that the blood shall be a token. And that's what I want us to look at today. What was the blood? What did it symbolize? What was the importance of the Lamb's blood upon the very mantle of the doorpost? That's what I want us to see. And to understand that this same picture that took place in Egypt over 2,000 years ago is today the same. It's a picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. There's no other teaching that should ever be taught from the pulpit, from the, from the churches and our communities or around the world other than the blood of Christ and the power of our Savior. Nothing else. There was no freedom for these people. God could have sent plague after plague, and he could have sent leader after leader, and God could have gotten them out at any point. But it took the blood <coughs> of the Lamb to take these people from their bondage to freedom and to the promised land. And understand today, as I teach this certain into small bits of Scripture, it is the blood of Christ that will take us from the bondage to the freedom that we can have in Christ that we read in the book of Galatians, to the promised land, which is heaven. It is only the blood of Jesus. There's nothing else. Not works, not good deeds, not money, not college degrees, not good looks, or nothing. Only the blood of Christ. And it says it is a token unto the people. And what is that token? What does it define? And what does it symbolize? The very first point here I want you to see it is it is protection. It is protecting these Hebrews. That's the very first point. Because God says, I will come into the city. I will come into there. And I will pass over. And the plague shall not be upon you, nor shall it destroy you. I will smite the land of Egypt. It is protection upon this people. I want you to understand what the language is here. And it's actually the only time in the entire scriptures you'll ever find this word in the Hebrew language. The word is Pesach. Defined. It is actually, it's interesting in studying this passage, in studying the Hebrew language, that it was actually almost an Egyptian, it was almost the spelling of an Egyptian word. I think it was defined so these people in Egypt would understand what God was doing. And it was defined in the Hebrew language. But it means exactly, it says to spread over. It is as the picture of, a, of an eagle spreading his wings out and protecting. She's protecting her young. You know this, how it, actually it's interesting, I was reading how an eagle teaches an eagle to fly is so interesting. The mother eagle will go into the nest and take the eaglet out and put, her on, put the, the baby, the eaglet, upon her back and there begin to fly. And what she'll do is she'll turn over and kick him off. And let him tumble through the air, end over end, over end, over end, falling. And she'll swoop down and catch him on her back and back up over and over and over until he learned to fly. He has to get out of the nest. He has to trust her in order to go to flight, to learn to fly, to be the greatest majestic bird in the world. It's what takes place really as Christians. We have to step out. We have to step out, whether it's into the aisle, we have to step out of the trust of God, we step out of the obedience of Christ, we step out in Him, 
and move into this world and the dangers and the difficulties of it, trusting our Lord and Savior, trusting Him alone, and there begin our journey as Christians. And that's the picture here. It is a symbol of that. It's interesting that He uses this word. But it's also another, it's interesting what it says. It's not only to, to, for protection, but it's also just a symbol, symbolic of the power of God because He not only said, I will pass over, I will pass over you, but it's like he says, I will stand at the door and protect you. I'll stand there and protect. No matter what, nothing is going to come through the door unless it's through me. I will protect the door. I'll protect your family. I'll protect your home. Your home. We'll all depart from this place and go home to our own houses, to our own families. And we do anything we can to protect and to guard our families from the world. You know, we'll lock the doors and we'll put alarms on our houses because we, we want to protect our families. But then if it's not, we're not careful, we'll turn on the TV and watch. We'll let the world into our home while we're, while we're guarding the doors. We'll let it come to the television morally and see that. But as far as physically protection, we do anything we can to protect our home, our wives, and our families because that's, in our, that's where we live. And God said here, you take the blood, I will not only pass over, but I will stand guard and protect. And you know, we read the scriptures of what it took that God protecting his people. If, you, if you've ever read the story of David and Goliath, David, a small boy, stepped out in faith into the valley to face the, the largest man the world had ever seen that would stand over nine foot tall, Goliath, fully armored and protected by the armor to which he had. The Bible said that David did not even wear the armor of the king who was so heavy. He stepped there with five small stones in his hand and brought down the biggest enemy there was. God protected him. You know the story of Daniel as he would go into the lion's den at night. Daniel was the only man to get any sleep in the night he was in the lion's den. The Bible says the king paced the floor all night worried about Daniel. Daniel's friends were terrified of him. They were up praying for Daniel what's going to take place. The soldiers were outside the lion's den celebrating because Daniel was being devoured. And Daniel lay down and went to sleep. God protected him. In the midst of the most dangerous time of his life, God protected him. We see the story of the three Hebrew children, the Bible says. They were taken into the fiery furnace. You can read that in the book of Daniel chapter 3. They were cast into the fiery furnace. And while they're standing in there and sitting arresting, the king says, look, there's a fourth one in there who is a symbol, who looks like and is Jesus Christ. It is interesting. God protects his people. He protected them. You think about the story of the wise men who came. Remember, they came following the star in the book of Luke chapter 2. They came and they were seeking Christ. In the book of Matthew, you read it of them in there. And they came. There they see the star in the east. They spend time with Harry. But God says, go a separate way home where I'll protect you. He protects his own. When Harry was going to slaughter every child under two years old, he took his only son, and Mary and Joseph, and sent them to Egypt, there to find safety. God protects His own. That's what I want you to understand today in this passage. God protects. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you surrender yourself to the blood of Christ, and surrender yourself in that relationship, He protects you. Are there struggles? Sure. Because we live in a fallen world. We live in a world in which we struggle a lot of times financially, or we struggle just trying to make ends meet, or we're just trying to work relationships. We're trying to do all of these things. The protection of God is there. I can only imagine. I, I remember reading some years ago of a story of a missionary. It says that they were there on. They were in, 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 the, in the midst of the struggles in which they were going through, and they were and they were almost to be killed. Actually, the Khmer Rouge was the the group that was killing them. They were the violent uh, group of people that we found there in uh, Southeast Asia. And it says they were fighting that night and they were struggling. One of the guys with them says, there's no need to worry. The troops are surrounding the village and God has surrounded them. I can see his hand of protection tonight. Just go to sleep. In which they did in the morning the army was gone. Because the hand of protection was upon them. The blood is a token, a picture of a token of the protection of God himself in Jesus Christ. That's the picture. The second we'll see here is cleansing. And I want to share with you from the book of Exodus chapter 11, verse 7, a very powerful part. 
It's interesting. I was reading this passage studying through the book of Exodus chapter 10 and chapter 11 and chapter 12 and the initiation and the, the really picture. But I was going to read the last part of this verse to help you understand. It's talking about the, there should not be a, uh, any children of Israel shall not, uh, no one shall move their tongue against man. But here in the last part of this verse, it says, that ye may know that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. Some translations define that as God sees the difference. God knows the difference between the children of Israel and those of Egypt. Because you see that in the plagues. What Egypt suffered, the children of Israel who lived in the land of Goshen did not. God protected them and he saw them differently. He sees them differently. I think about us today in 2017. As we know Jesus Christ, we're to be completely different than the world. It's so easy for Christians to blend into society because we begin to accept things that society teaches us that it's okay. That is no problem. There's no harm in it at all. As long as you just kind of do your own thing and stay here, there's no struggle or problem. I was talking to a pastor friend of mine in Charlotte. They have a park near their church, and they go into the park, and they do a club in the summertime. It's kind of like we do party in the park. It's uh, like a vacation Bible school. And they go back there and play, and have sports and games and snow cones, and the community kids come, and they hang out there. The church, the back side of the parking lot of the church has a fence, and then you get, when you go to the fence, you go into the park. And they, the, the city allows them to use that park at their leisure. They can use it with any, no trouble at all. There's just one stipulation. They can never teach a Bible study or a story on the name of Jesus Christ in that park. Feel free to use it for games, and feel free to use it for fun, and feel free to use it for snacks, and the enjoyment of an afternoon for a family. But you can never teach the name of Jesus Christ in that park. It's okay as long as you stay on your side of the fence. As long as it's okay as long as you stay in your compound and your box. As long as you never have a desire to step out, it's okay. But when you step out of that box, then you better be prepared for the struggles and the problems and the difficulties and the lawsuits and the courts and the mockery that will come with it. And I've appreciated my friend there because he said what we've done is we've taken the gospel into that park. They stepped out. For several years they were scared to death. What was next? What was next? What was next? They would not do it. And finally they decided, it's time that we make a stand for God. This is our community too. This is our city as well. We live here with them. It's time that we made a stand for Jesus Christ. And they've taken that into that part. Have they faced some trouble? Sure. Have they faced problems? Most definitely. They've taken it into the park. They're no longer the same church. They're no longer afraid. The protection of God is there and they've stepped out. As Christians, we have to step out. We have to. We have to be different than the world. If all we're doing is blending into the world and all this church is doing is blending into our community, that's all we're doing. We're not serving faithfully. The Bible pictures it right here perfectly. He said, I know the difference between the Egyptians and I know the difference between the Hebrews. I know the difference, God says. I know them, I can see it, and I'll treat them differently. And as believers in Christ, we too are the same. And he says here, I know the difference. But it's interesting, he said, and I'm not going to read the entire passage, but he says to take an unblemished lamb and there's slaughter the lamb for your protection. <coughs> it's different. When God began to take care of these things, but an unblemished lamb, a lamb of no marks, and a lamb that is perfect, that they take this lamb and kill it and put it upon the doorpost and there to celebrate Passover that is being instituted for the first time. They're taking it here. If you read this passage here, it begins to define the Passover. It begins to define what it really is. And it was telling them that they ate the bitter herbs to which they would remember Egypt and where they had suffered for their whole lives and passed that from generation to generation. They would not only partake of those bitter herbs, but they would sit at that table. They would sit there and hear the weeping and the crying and the wailing of Egypt. They would sit there at that table with their family. It was a time of family. It was a time of coming together. It was a time of celebration. It was a time of departure. The departure was near. God was getting his people and moving them out. He didn't move the Egyptians across the desert and through the Red Sea and onto the Promised Land. He moved the Hebrew children. He moved those, his own people, through the journey of the wilderness. And in our wilderness travel on a day in and day out basis that which we go through, 
God knows the Christians from the world. The Bible says, He will separate the sheep and the goat in the time of judgment. He will separate them. He knows the difference. Now we outwardly can say anything we want to say and we can live and tell people what we do. But inwardly is our hearts. The Bible says that God <coughs> knows the difference. God knows the difference. His hand of protection is upon those. And I've seen God's hand of protection. Through the grace and the love of this church and through God, I've taken our youth in some crazy places. Crazy places. We spent a summer one week in Cleveland, Ohio. It was a rough neighborhood. In Yakin County, we'd never seen anything like it. But they said they loved when the church people came. Every summer was great for that week. Because the drug dealers laid down their drugs, they put their guns up, and allowed the church kids to roam the neighborhood and serve them there. That's the protection of God. It is. It's a tiny little church called Victory Baptist Chapel. And it sits there in inner city Cleveland, and we spent a week there at the Bible school, and we had to go up to the Y to uh, take our showers, and we went up to the YMCA and spent some time there through the ministry and through the, on the playground there with those kids. And those kids from that community came together. God protect us. It was. It was just protection. He trusted him. As we stepped out in faith, we didn't do anything crazy. And we <coughs> obeyed the rules to which were there that were set for us. But how well they took care of us and how free we were to share the name of Jesus Christ. You can share it in the park. You can share it in the basketball court or at the swimming pool or on the street. It did not matter to those people because they were hungry for the gospel. They were hungry. This is interesting. We never identified ourselves part of any of the locals, but they knew our kids and those that were there. They knew the church kids. That's why they said they love the missionary kids. They love the missionary kids when they come here. We can tell a difference in them. They can see a difference, hear a difference, and know a difference. The difference was they were all teenagers, yes, and all teenagers are about the same. They have the same likes and dislikes. They're very similar. But the difference was the love of Christ they had in their heart to share that to a community that needed Jesus. And that's our role here in South Oak Ridge. And our role as Christians in this community is to be different, to reach out to home, to home, to home, to help physically. Sure, we do that through the past, we do that through here. Hardly a week goes by, we don't reach out to get to have the privilege to help somebody, to help them financially, to help them physically. But we must never help them physically without helping them spiritually and share with them the gospel of Christ. That's the power of change. That's the cleansing. He was cleaning. He was cleaning their hearts. He was cleaning them for preparation to go. And that brings us to the last point, is substitution. It says, and the blood shall be for you a token. It's only a picture. It's just a picture is all it is. It's a token that you put this blood over your doorpost, and I will come, protect you, stand guard, and pass by. For inside that home you're being cleansed. Cleansed with the herbs. Cleansed with the blood. Cleansed with the lamb. Cleansed in your homes. With your families. And now we see the picture of substitution. And I want you to understand now. This is a very powerful and point of the scriptures. It's the substitution to which God took. And substituted for us. Christ. It is seen as early as in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. You know the story. Remember, Adam and Eve, they sinned. And what took place was they had to kill the animals to put, to put the skin up on them to wear. You know, they covered themselves with fig leaves. But God said, it's more than that. It's more than that, Adam and Eve. It's more than having fig leaves. It's more than what you've done for taking of what's that, the fruit, the apple. It's more than that. It's the fact of what you've done to me. And it requires sacrifice. It required the death of an innocent animal to cover their bodies. That's where God began the process. It required it to cover their bodies to take place. We see that all through here. You can read on as you go into the book of Hebrews. And it says that it will take more than bulls and goats and sheep and lamb to protect you. It takes the blood of Christ. He is the substitute. He is the picture. And we see this coming through the scriptures time after time after time is a substitute that would take the place. You know, and finally we come to the book of, you've got Exodus, and then they journey, and you come to the book of Leviticus, and God there sets the standards for sacrifice. And he 
sets the, the duty of sacrifice that takes place. And there he prepares and gives them a scapegoat. They put the sins on here and they send it into the wilderness. But in order for Christ to forgive, in order to find that relationship in Jesus Christ, it comes with a price. And that price is paid. We see in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it defines in there for us that the, the substitute could only be one. That was God himself, Jesus Christ. That's who he was. As we kind of close today, I want to take you a, a journey, a picture in your own mind of Christ. There's 1,500 years in the span of time between children of Israel leaving Egypt to the time on the hills of the shores of that same Jordan River which they would cross. There Jesus would come to be baptized. The Bible says that John the Baptist was preaching. He lived in a small community there this a little bit north of the Jordan River which is called Qumran. He lived there with a group of people called the Essenes. And he would make his way down to the Jordan River and there he would baptize. The Bible tells us that he preached repentance, repentance, repentance to know Christ. That's what he preached. That's what we have to preach today. It is repentance and confession of our sins to Jesus Christ. But the story tells us that Christ, that John is baptizing there in the Jordan River and coming over the top of the hill, making his way down, is the Savior of the world. The Bible tells us in the book of John, chapter 1, in two verses, it says, and, and John said, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Now, it's interesting he defined him as that. It's the first time that John has seen Jesus come across the hillside and down the hill. He didn't say there's the Savior, there's the miracle worker, there's the healer, there's my cousin. He didn't say any of those things. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God, He will take away the sins of all the world. Jesus made his way to that river and there he was baptized by John. Do you know the story? And then Jesus began his earthly ministry. For three years he traveled and traversed the roads of Jericho and Jerusalem and Bethlehem and Galilee and Capernaum. He just made his round after round after round, walking, <coughs> teaching, as an itinerant preacher as far north as Philippi and as far south as Caesarea. He made his round, just circling the community, preaching and teaching of the cleansing and the picture of the protection of God and the repentance of sins which he required. He preached and he preached. And there Christ would make his way from that river and into the wilderness to be tempted and on three years to Jerusalem to be taken to the cross. The substitute. The substitute. Have you ever read the book of Leviticus and see the duties that it took and it required to kill an animal, to slaughter the animal, to place it upon the altar and to follow those rules? God is precise and exact, and if they weren't followed precisely and exactly, then he dealt with that person, and then another one came along. But God fulfilled all of that, and he gave the ultimate substitute, Jesus Christ. He fulfilled it. 1,500 years had passed, and these struggles, and these people in their journey that had made to the promised land, and the struggles and the problems they faced, and coming along through captivity, and through the entire Old Testament. Then Jesus said, Behold, here's the Lamb. John said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God, the unblemished Lamb, the sinless Lamb. The high priest is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. There is no substitute. There is no substitute for Jesus Christ. He is the only salvation. And that worries me so much in some of our churches. We've gotten away from teaching Christ. Teaching the blood of Jesus Christ. We've gone to these self-help books and the guidance of these books and the good feeling, the nice things, and the great works of the community. Those are all grand. But they're not. There is no substitute for Jesus Christ. Christ is the substitute for us on that cross and He is our salvation. He is it. That's the place. God humbled Pharaoh. He literally humiliated him and took away everything he had because he was going to demonstrate and show his power, his sovereignty, but greater than that, his grace. He showed his grace because he gave everyone a way out. Just paint the blood over the door and you'll find the freedom. He gives that to us today. Just accept Christ as Savior 
and you'll find the freedom. The freedom to which you never imagined was only found in the Savior. That's the tenth plague. That was the freedom. The freedom was the blood. The freedom was the sacrifice of the unblemished lamb. The freedom was the protection of God. And we have that today. And that comes to know Jesus Christ. And to build that relationship. You don't think it's important to send our kids to church camp? It's vital. Because we send them, they grow in the name of Christ. We send our youth and our adults out in New York and impact gag. And those are important things locally. Because we send them out to do the work which we're called to do. And the Hands of Hope mission. And the, we have the Compassion Care and the Act All these are ministries, Christian ministries. But we reach out. But we, no matter what we give, we give them the love of Christ. For Jesus was our substitute. And there's no substitute for the Savior. That's where we come today. Have you accepted Christ? Do you know Him in that relationship? If not, you're struggling a little bit. It's only Christ that will save you. Not of works, only Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Sunday mornings and thank you for your word and thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for those that struggled in Egypt. Because only through the blood were their struggles stopped and freedom was found. And Father, today, 2,000 years later, we struggle in, in problems, we struggle in hurts and maybe it's relationships or whatever it is to all of us. Father, that struggling can end through a relationship with you. We don't live in a perfect world. We live in a sinful world. But Father, you're the light of that world. You're the light of the darkness. Father, you are salvation and you alone. Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. I pray for this room today. Maybe there's someone that needs you for the first time. Or maybe there's someone that's a Christian that needs us to pray. Father, to come back to the cleansing that can only be found in the Savior. In your name I pray. We'll stand and sing 320. Turn your eyes upon Jesus.